And we're back. I'm Bill Hellcamp of Reach Development Systems. With me is Professor Scott Plum of the Minnesota Sales Institute. Welcome back, Scott. Great to be with you and, and our listeners. Imagine you just held the best prospect meeting ever. They asked you all the right questions. You gave them all the right answers. There were no follow-up questions. It was a drop the mic moment. Silence. Then they said, well, thank you for coming in. I can tell you really know your stuff. You taught me a lot. I can see why so many people pick you. I will think this over and get back to you. Now you want to pick up the mic and ask, what happened? In this episode, Bill and I will investigate the I need to think it over objection and how you can deal with it and much more in episode 411 of Get In The Door podcast. Well, we're going to start out with our book club. We're talking about the book, The Magic of Thinking Big by David J. Schwartz. And we are on chapter eight, Make Your Attitudes Your Allies. I know, Scott, the second podcast we did after our intro podcast was all about attitude. And that's one of our most popular podcasts so far. Yeah, it is. And I, I found it interesting the way he talked about attitude and the attitudes you have to develop. And we'll talk about that in a moment. But one of his major points was that the inner attitude that you have, you transmit those to others at a subconscious level. And I think that's why a lot of salespeople fail is because they transmit and they don't even know they're doing it an attitude of I'm trying to take advantage of you or an attitude of I just need your business or an attitude of desperation sometimes. Mm, have yeah. you seen those kind of attitudes transmitted by salespeople? I have. You know, and it kind of goes back to the so much of communication is body language and what mm. message people portray in their actions and the confidence that they have in themselves, the company, the marketplace, the product, et cetera, and how much they really want to invest in the relationship and the conversation. And sometimes it really shows through the body language, it shows through the tone, and then the words, of course, but most importantly, it's what kind of demeanor do you have when you're engaged in a conversation with somebody? And that confidence can be contagious and it can really demonstrate a certain amount of value and credibility in the conversation. And think about what are the fears of a prospect as being hustled and taken advantage of, like you right. said. So when we really portray that confidence, it really reduces the fears. Yeah. How, and how can we develop that confidence? And that's what uh, David Schwartz talks about in the rest of the chapter. And he really spends time, he calls them the three important attitudes to develop. And maybe we'll play with each of these uh, one at yeah. a time. But this first one is, I'm activated. Mm -hmm. and he says, you have to develop a real internal enthusiasm. And I don't remember if we did this in the book, but, but enthusiasm is, uh, taking apart the word, it's entheos, which is God within. So mm. can you generate an inner energy? And then he talks about walking faster, talking with more energy faking it sometimes till you make it to create that energy. Yeah. I always have a saying, never hire anybody that walks slow. Um, <laughs> I, I, I look at myself sometimes when I'm walking up against the reflective glass of a building and I'm walking at a pretty good pace. And I look at that reflection in the mirror. I go, gosh, I'm walking just like my grandfather who was a farmer. And boy, every time he was walking, he had some place to be, he had something to do. Right. And I can see myself doing that. And sometimes when I work with a company on interviewing salespeople and I see a salesperson, a candidate kind of shuffling along and moseying about. And I'm thinking this person has no uh, enthusiasm. It has no energy. It has no motivation. Yeah, but they look it's so scary. cool. They look so right. Cool. Yeah. You know, hey, man, that's just hey, the way man. I roll. Man. I got my hands in my pockets <laughs> and I just, I'm sauntering along, man. So we, we could I'll go get to that happen. sales call presently, but I'm kind of cool right now. On, on another note with this, I think when he talks about attitude and enthusiasm, when we're really stuck in a bit of a rut, I think we need to think about how do we get out of the rut? And I think really committing to the behavior really changes an attitude. Mm -hmm. And when we just commit to the basics, we go, you know what? I got to make five calls today. I'm not sure if I'm going to get through to anyone. I want to have a conversation. I'm going to do everything I can to start a conversation. And then all of a sudden you have that conversation. You feel great. Your attitude changes. And it's all because you committed to your behavior. So if you're in a rut, Commit to your behavior and just put it in four-wheel drive high, as I say, and just get out of that rut, and you'll just feel so much better. I had a guy I worked with that uh, used to do a little horn blast, and he'll charge. He'd go, da-da-da-da-da, charge. <laughs> and then he'd start making his phone calls, and he just got 
you know, he had to get himself fired up, right? So right, what do we do right. to get ourselves fired up? I know in one of the past shows we talked about, uh, you know, writing a card of, of affirmations. Mm -hmm. whatever you need to do and and sometimes you do need to fake it and the the way your body you make your body behave you smile more walk faster talk faster and create that energy yeah yeah exactly the second point he wants to talk about the attitude you need to develop is you are important not not me as important but everyone i meet is important and he talks about treating people well um whether they're waiters or the secretary or and I've heard so many stories about people that have quit doing business with somebody because they treated the little guy poorly. So treating others well, learning their names, and then showing appreciation for the efforts of others. As we're doing more work on Zoom and online and we're not going out and meeting people, it's always great to, when you talk to somebody on the phone, write their name down. Just right away. Write it down on a piece of paper if you're keeping a, a notepad and you're keeping all your, your notes and your journal entries into it, just write their name down so you constantly remember their name. And a good time to use their name is at the beginning of a conversation and at the end of a conversation. Dale Carnegie, I remember when I used to teach that, he talked about you know using the name three, four times, asking them how to spell it, mm, yeah. um, especially if it's a, a strange name, and how important it is that people want their name pronounced properly. Yeah, yeah. when you're working with people or talking with them, Keep in mind that everybody's fighting a battle that you know nothing about. Mm. And if we start to judge a situation and we determine whether we're, you know, we like the person or not like the person, we really kind of lose our perspective and we end up drowning out the facts of a conversation because we're inserting our own opinion and our own judgment. Right. And if we want to search for the truth, if we drop our own bias and judgment, the truth presents itself. People deserve appreciation. As you say, we don't know what their life story is. Yeah. You don't know what they had to overcome to just get where they are. And maybe they're not where you are, but show appreciation for the effort that they're making. I love people who make an effort, mm -hmm. uh, who are trying, failing and trying. So show appreciation for, for that effort, not always for the success. Amen. And then the third type of attitude is service first. And I think this has really been lost by many people in this country. Do your best work all the time. Serve your customer fully. Don't start looking for the payoff before you do the service. The payoff comes after you create the service attitude. I think integrity is something that every, every person strives for or they should strive for. And think about how do you demonstrate your integrity? How do you demonstrate that reputation that you want people to, to use to describe who you are in your absence? Mm. I think about when I was working in the restaurant business, it seemed to be that I was the one that was always training in the new servers. And I always wanted to do the, the procedure the correct way as I was training them. And then over time, we learn shortcuts, but we still get to the same outcome. Right. But I think integrity is acting like somebody is always watching, mm -hmm. acting like you're training somebody in on doing it the right way. And when you're acting like somebody's watching, then you're really demonstrating that commitment to, to service first, the integrity that you want to be known for and the reputation that you want to build within your network, whether it be your colleagues, your prospects, your clients, your customers, et cetera. It's so important to have integrity for yourself so that when you lay your head down on the pillow at night, you know that you did your best work and you're not worrying and thinking about, boy, I, I cut a corner here. I hope nobody catches me. Conscious. So. Learn these three important attitudes or develop these attitudes according to Dr. Schwartz. I'm activated, the people I meet are important, and I'm going to give service first. And that is all in chapter eight of The Magic of Thinking Big, Make Your Attitudes Your Allies. This segment of Get Into Our Podcast is brought to you by The Art of Prospecting, Your Guide to Getting in the Door by Steve Cloyda. Steve Cloyda was known internationally for increasing salespeople's ability to make solid appointments with qualified prospects. You too can learn this essential skill by ordering a copy of his superb book, The Art of Prospecting, Your Guide to Getting in the Door. In this book, Steve shares the top strategies and tactics he has developed, implemented, and personally tested with more than one million sales and prospecting calls. You can get his book on the website, theprospectingexpert.com. 
In addition, check out his other great online resources. Instant Sales Coaching, which will guide you through five online success modules. A guided prospecting process entitled Call Reluctance Transformer. And the Magnetic Selling Strategies Workbook, a detailed step-by-step -step guide to increasing your sales. Get any of these valuable resources at theprospectingexpert.com. So our topic today is that objection that we get sometimes when we talk to a prospect. Um, I want to think it over or I need to think about it. And when we get that, we have to really kind of scratch our head and go, what, what could I have done different? I think after every sales call, you should debrief. You should just take five to 10 minutes, think about what you did well, what you do again, and if there's anything that you'd like to improve and do over. If you had another chance, what would you do different? And if we don't do that, we're never going to improve. If we don't debrief after a sales call, we're going to get the same outcome the next time we do it as we did this time. Now, there takes a certain amount of, of skill and seasoning and time and experience to really master something, but still, it, as you're mastering it, the market is changing. So we need to think about how the market is changing. How do we stay relevant in the marketplace? How do we become aware of how people are making decisions and be able to adapt accordingly? So I want to start this, this topic with a couple of questions, and that is, what are your prospects thinking about after an appointment? Let's assume that it's your first appointment, you're going in there, you're collecting information, you're qualifying them, you're sharing some information, you're learning things about what the expectations are, what the prospect wants, et cetera. What are your prospects thinking about after the appointment? And what do you want your prospects to dwell on after the appointment? And if we don't start with those two questions and focus on everything that we do to address those two questions, it's possible that we're going to get a think it over at the end. Or we need to define what our prospects are going to be thinking about when the appointment is over with. So I want to consider a few other questions to keep in mind as you're starting an appointment. All right. Are you interested and curious about exploring other options? That's one thing that you can ask a prospect when you're working with them. Mm -hmm. And then ask them, what would you like to change? And then get them to talk a little bit about what they'd like to change. A good, right. good approach to do this is on a scale of one to 10, how satisfied are you with the current outcome or the current provider or the results that you're getting? And you might get a seven or you might get an eight and you say, wow, that's pretty high. Why so high? Let them brag about some of the things that they've picked, that they're receiving, that they like. Because guess what? They want the same thing from you. And then say, I noticed that you didn't give them a 10. What's missing between a 7 and 8 and a 10? And then write those things down that are missing. Because if you can provide that and deliver what they like about their current provider or the results that they're getting, you may have a better solution for them. What I like about the series of questions that you're developing is that they explore the idea of, I need to make a change. And one of the challenges with the, I need to think about it, I need to think it over, all that <laughs> is you've never created a sense of urgency that says this needs to change now. That now is the time and waiting isn't a better solution. And that's where your questions are driving the prospect. Yeah. You know, do you want to have other options? If you don't want to have other options, why are we even meeting? Right. Uh, and when would you like, what would you like to change? And how important is that change to you? And why should we do it now? All of those are driving toward when we give you an option, the answers are you want A or B, but you got to do something. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think creating that urgency is really up to the salesperson. They have to drive the meeting. They have to lead the conversation to create that urgency. And the urgency is the motivation the emotionally moving motivation for somebody to make a change and to, to ask them, you know, what would you like to see in a better solution? Yep. And, and now keep in mind, people are going to buy for their reasons, not yours. And when you can find their reasons, they can learn about their reasons and they may have never thought about a better solution. They may have never thought about the challenges that, that they're facing with the current provider or the current solution that they have until you come into the room and then you start asking questions. They didn't know they had a problem until you start asking them questions. I think so many salespeople tend to think that the only barrier to buying is price. Right. And yeah. they don't understand the inner barriers in an organization. If I'm going to do something different, I have to take on a new vendor. And mm. my gosh, some of us have, have applied for vendorship at 
at companies and know what a rat race that can be. Right. Or if I'm going to sell it, if I'm selling software, uh, boy, everybody looks and goes, man, I got to install this thing and migrate all my information to this new package, man. That's, that's a two year program. And I, I don't know if I'm going to be around that long. So why should I take it on? Right. So there's right. all these different things going on that change causes in their environment. You and I both sell the idea of getting your people trained on in new sales techniques. Mm-hmm. Well, now I got to pull my people out of the field and they're not going to be selling then. And then I've got to overcome the complaining that happens because oh, I got to another program. And some of those things are the things that are barriers in addition to I have to pay for this thing. So some other questions to, to keep in mind, and but backing up a little bit on some of what we said the, about salespeople thinking that people buy on the cheapest price. I think there's two major assumptions that salespeople have when they're talking with a prospect. One is that salespeople think everybody has a problem and wants the cheapest price. Mm. And that is just simply not true. Uh, not everybody has a problem. There are some people that are doing it right. There are some people that you cannot work with because everything is going good. You cannot sell everybody. And I know that may be hard to believe, but there are some people that have it figured out already before you showed up and they're doing perfectly well and there's no reason for them to change. Another assumption that people make is that people buy solutions on price and they know what they want. It, it's just simply not true. Prospects mm-hmm. don't always know what they want. And sometimes their idea of a solution may create a bigger problem. So people buy on outcomes. There's one thing that you sell. You sell an outcome. You sell a result. And if you focus on what the people want and find a way to deliver what they want, it's going to make a better fit for you and for the prospect. So so keep that in mind. Right. I think that one of the biggest reasons that we get objections is that we miss something in the sales process. And this goes back to the questions you're asking early on. So often salespeople are afraid to ask the difficult questions. Do you have the money for this? If we're able to come up with a a program that you like, are you really ready to move forward? What's your timing on this? Is this something that you feel needs to happen right away? These are questions that have to be asked early in the process before you spend 16 hours putting together a complicated proposal. Who else are you talking to? Who else are you working with? One of the common things we deal with is that we come in and we're just the third vendors so that they can say they talked to three vendors and and got three proposals, but they already picked who they wanted. And there's so many salesmen putting out 16 page, 20 page proposals, complicated proposals that don't have a chance because they weren't even really in the process. They weren't really in the running at all. So I think salespeople are often surprised or fooled because they didn't pay attention to what the prospect was really telling them. Mm -hmm. I love the question, why now? Why would you like them to make a change now? Why don't you wait on it? What would happen if you waited? And what would would happen if we decided to wait? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, why, why are we, why are we talking now? Why not last week or why not next month or the next quarter and, and find out what their motivation is. There's something that happened a moment before you entered the room or got the phone call from a prospect. There's something that happened just before that, that mm-hmm. prompted that motivation for your prospect to reach out and have a conversation with you. And finding that out is really going to give you some insider information on their motivation. Well, and hopefully the only customers you're getting aren't the ones who called you. That True. you did a yeah. little bit of calling. And sometimes we find that we get pretty good at prospecting and we have a meeting and the client doesn't even really know why they agreed to it. Mm-hmm. And that, why are we talking here? What is those early questions about what do you want to do differently that you mentioned are very important when we've created the, the appointment because they might not really have an idea and we've got to delve into the issues a little bit deeper to see if we can find something to hook onto. Because as you said, the customer's, they don't always really know what the need is. They just have this nagging fear of maybe they're going to get left in the dust. Yeah, so they'll take yeah. the meeting, but they don't really have a good reason why. And you need to create that reason. Creating a scenario that they can relate to that is a possible problem that they may have, or it may be something that they could experience in the future. So we really address two types of problems, the current problems and latent problems, problems that happen down the road that prospects need to prepare for. 
Mm-hmm. Um, I think one of the greatest competitions that we all deal with, salespeople deal with, is in action. It's prospects doing nothing. So when we don't create that urgency, we don't uncover the motivation, we don't know what a new solution would do for their business or for their family or for their personal life. So if we can't look at the application of a new solution and the benefit, outcome, and impact on the person personally and, and financially and also for business reasons, then we're really losing that, that motivation and the reason why somebody might want to make a change because we are competing against inaction. People do not want to make a change. Right. And that's driving out or driving down to the real reason, right? The questioning that takes them to, if we can get this process working better for you, what are you going to get? Well, I'm going to save time. And what would you do with that time that you save? Mm, right. I'd like to go home before six o'clock yeah. or seven o'clock in the in the evening. Well, why would you want to do that? Well, I got young kids. Yeah. I'd like to see them yeah. before they go to bed. Bingo. Yeah. Now we've hit on something that not only is uh, a business reason, but we also have a personal reason to go for this. And, and that's the one we can drive to and, and have a fun conversation around. And it's like, Larry, let's get you home at five o'clock every night. Yeah. Right. I mean, it's amazing when you start asking that question, some of the answers that you hear. I mean, I heard, I, I asked that question one time and the answer was, well, I need to get out of here at five o'clock so I can pick my kids up from daycare because every minute I'm late, it's costing me a buck. And I'm telling you, <laughs> when I have to explain that to my husband or wife, I can't remember what, what gender it was, yep. it, it gets to be a really tough conversation because I didn't get out of the office on time. That's and it's right. costing me money when I don't get out of the office on time. That's right. And, and I don't want my kids sitting around being the last one being picked up at the daycare and feeling like mom doesn't care or dad doesn't care <laughs> because, you know, they're always late because their jobs are more important. So we can get into those emotional issues and you'll be surprised that that prospect will, will reveal those things to, the, to you if you have the courage to ask the question. Let's go and look at your, uh, your example that you opened up with, right? You had, get the the drop the mic moment, everything sounds yeah. good and you get the, I'm going to think about it. What do you do then? Because we, we, we fall on our, into that trap. Now we're trapped. What, what would you do at that point? Sure. First, I would look at those situations and find out, did I really uncover the motivation on why they wanted to make a change? As a salesperson, did I really find that out? Do I know what that answer is? Can I go back to the office and tell my sales manager what their motivation is for making a change? And if I can't explain that, then that's something that I did not uncover. So can you try to uncover it at this point? You can. So at the, at that point, and they say, you know, I really appreciate that. Thank you. That, that is the reason why so many people hire me to come in. You know, I'm kind of curious based on our conversation, what did you like most about what we talked about? Mm -hmm. And then you're kind of getting them to summarize what was most interesting to them. And then you could maybe go back and say, you know, based on that, what's holding you back from making a change now so you can find out what some of the objections are, what some of the barriers are. Right. You may find out more about the process and the people that's involved. You may find out about an existing contract or an agreement that's in place that is being held in, in the way of making a change. Yep. And or you may find out a timeline that they want to pick or not pick. So you, and, really, you really want to drive, okay, I've got the objection now, whether it's price or right. whatever. I'm going to have to, to drive with some more questions into finding out why they're giving me this objection now. Something, exactly. Something that I didn't do before, I have to do now, right? So, so I might say, gee, I'm, I'm sorry if I didn't, wasn't really clear in, in this proposal or this explanation. Let's talk about what you need to think about. Tell me what it is that you want to continue to think about. Right. I, I right? think so a good response. you I need to think about it. Tell me what, what it is. What are you thinking yeah. about, right? I, first of all, take ownership of it. Go, you know, that's my fault. Right. I didn't, I didn't do a good enough job of really uncovering the reasons on why you would want to make a change. So as you were preparing for our meeting today, what are some of the things that you wanted to learn about what we do? What are some of the challenges that you wanted to talk about that you wanted to solve? So as you were getting ready for our meeting, what, what, what did you want to cover? Mm-hmm. And now you're finding out what their agenda is before the, the meeting occurred. And you're trying and, to find out the objection behind the objection. Right. Because it, yeah. it might yeah. be I need to think about it because I need to talk to my boss. Right. 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 And I should have, I should have found that out earlier. I may need to think about it because this is out of my budget. Mm-hmm. So that I need to think about it can be a smoke screen for some other detail. And hopefully through that questioning, you can find out what that other detail you missed was. Now I got one that I, that I like to use on the, uh, the delayer forever. 
No. So have, we, have you ever dealt with a, you know, you call them back and they're still thinking yeah. and you call them back and they're still thinking. Right. But here's you the one get, that I like to use. Yeah. Okay. Go ahead. Scott, it sounds like you want to tell me no. <laughs> yeah. So, so what, uh, what are your choices on that, Scott? Well, yeah, that's true. Or no, that's not true at all. Well, well Scott, so, if you don't want to tell me no, the only other solution is yes, right? Right, exactly. So how how am I going to help you get to how am I going to help you get you get this to yes? What are we? Well, doing? I I don't know that there's anything you can do. So they're going to continue to string you along when they're really well, wanting to tell you no. Well, that's the what, and that's what I found out. Right, if yeah. they want to tell me no, save me time, save them time, tell me no, and they right. will. They'll say, you know, Bill, I, yeah, I guess this isn't really what we needed. Okay, great. Mm -hmm. I can I can deal with that. I can't deal with the delay forever. Right. Right. But if they tell me, well, no, Bill, I don't want to tell you no, then we're going to move this forward. And I have not had a situation where they've said to me on a delay or like this, no, I, I don't want to tell you no, yeah. where we haven't closed the deal eventually. Because they've, they've committed, when they don't tell me no at that point, they've committed to yes, they just don't know it. I think there are some people that don't follow up because they don't want to sound like they're desperate. Mm. And I, I like the approach of like the third call. So here's the third message. It's, that you leave a third, third attempt, third message. Here's the message you lay down on the, on the voicemail tape. You go, you know, I was figuring it out this morning as I was getting ready. You're testing me. You're testing me to see how committed I am. <laughs> so when I say I'm going to call you back in two days, I'm laying down a promise that I'm going to call you back in two days. And if I don't call you back in two days, you're not going to trust me and you're not going to feel confident buying from me because if I can't give you the confidence as a prospect, how can I give you the confidence as a customer or a client? So I learned today that you're testing me to see how committed I am. And I'm really glad that we had this time together. And I'm really glad that you're really considering me because you're testing me. <laughs> I'll call you back in two days. And then you call back in two days and say, I'm just following up on my promise. Yep. You know, competition is tough. I mean, you must be looking at some other folks. I'm really glad that I'm staying in the race and you're still considering me because we can really do a lot of stuff together. Right. And then you say, I'll call you back in two days. So finally you get to about the, the sixth or seventh call and you say, you know, I really get the impression that either you've moved on um, you're no longer responsible for this project. Maybe you've left the company. Maybe there's somebody else that's in charge. I'm going to have to start over and find out who's in charge of this project. So if I'm wrong, give me a call by the end of the day. Um, or if I don't hear from you, I'll just have to assume that I have to start over and call somebody else. Hey, Bob, now, I've been looking at the obituaries and I haven't yeah. seen your name. <laughs> you know, so I'm assuming you're not dead. I'm just calling, you know, the secretary, the receptionist going, I'm wondering where I should send the flowers. <laughs> what, do you, what do you mean? <laughs> well, you know, Bob Johnson hasn't called me back. I left six messages. I'm kind of curious. Did he pass? <laughs> well, no, he's still here. I go, okay, no, we, so he didn't get terminated. He didn't, yeah. he didn't pass. He's still with us then, right? We, yeah, we fired okay. Bob for not answering messages. Right, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All so, right. So, I mean, Scott, yeah, what are some of the resources? Do you have any resources that people can go to yeah, on your yeah. site? I'm going to put a link to the blog on why now and why that question is so important and some other okay. ways that you can ask that question. So look for that on the show notes. Great. And then uh, we didn't talk about this, but uh, I think a lot of times people don't do something because they're confused. Mm. And the salespeople confuse them by talking about the wrong thing. So, I have a two minute selling tip video uh, called number 33, a confused customer. And you can find that uh, either on uh, YouTube or at my site. So our golden nugget for this week is a quote from Robert Frost. The reason why worry kills more people than work is that more people worry than work. And I chose this quote because I see this happening a lot as people, as salespeople are trying to change their style of selling based on the lack of personal appointments, doing things on Zoom, and a lot of people are wringing their hands, hoping things go back to the way they were mm. instead of just doing the work it's going to take to create sales in a new environment. Yeah, it, it sounds like, you know, when people worry, they don't feel like they're in control. And... I always am entertained by the fear of prospecting, the fear of cold calling, and the fear of zip lining. I think some people are excited about zip lining, but they're not excited about making cold calls. So I, I always ask people, are you excited or are you scared? Then the, the follow-up question is, if you're excited, that that means that you're in charge. If you're scared, that means that somebody else is in charge. 
And worrying can make it evident of us feeling like whether we're in control or whether we're in charge or not. And, and we are in charge. We're, we're always in charge of what we do and don't do. So when we think about worrying, we have to think about where's the evidence to support the worry and what can I do to eliminate the worry? Yeah. You know, and I think work cures worry. Mm, it does. If I go and start doing something that is a positive part of my work, whether it's picking up the phone and calling an old customer or getting something done, then I'd worry less. But if I just sit there paralyzed with some kind of worry or fear, I can't move forward. So start working and it will cure your worry. So everything that Bill and I talked about today is going to be on the show notes at getinthedoorpodcast.com. You can also visit Bill's site at reachdev.com. Next week, we're going to be covering chapter nine in the book, The Magic of Thinking Big, Think Right Towards People. And our key topic is going to be sales posture and confidence, which is talking about how you look in front of your customer and kind of how we talked about today, that attitude that you bring into the sales call. Thanks for being with us on the Get In The Door podcast. Have a great week. Thank you.